I want to speak today from Mark chapter 11, a call to supernatural living, a call to supernatural living. And one of the reasons I believe that God has chosen, prepared, and molded Pastor Tim to come for such a time as this it is because he's a man that, is, that understands that the kingdom of God must go forward in this church and through this church in supernatural power, not in natural, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And, and a call to supernatural living, but my actual real title is a heart cry. It is something that I have spoken recently at our church and also made it the, the, the rally cry of our whole leadership team and pastors and leaders. Uh, we have been we have uh, uh, entered into this uh, uh, fall season with this cry on our heart. The, the title is a call to supernatural living, but the real title is this declaration, I will not be a withered fig tree. I, I, I got one and a half amen at the first service, zero at the second service. So I'm going to ask you to say it out loud with me. I will not be a withered fig tree. Just a little bit more. I will not be a withered fig tree. This declaration, this decision and determination is one of the most important in your life because Jesus said you will recognize them by their fruit. You can only, this is how you'll recognize, you'll, this is how you'll differentiate my people. They will be walking and bearing supernatural fruit. They will shine with supernatural fruit. We are called and mandated to bear much fruit, for it is the only way the Father will be glorified. Only if we, if we are bearing supernatural fruit. Bearing supernatural fruit is not a question or a matter of how long you've been in church, how many verses you know, how many doctrines you can argue. Uh, it, it's not either a, a, a case of uh, how new you are because I know there's so many new believers I see every week. What a, I believe Pastor Tim has a unique anointing to call people to salvation. So online and in the church, can we rejoice together at how many souls are coming to Christ through Times Square Church? Mm. But it's not a matter of how long you've been there or how, how, new you, how new you are because Jesus said, if you abide in me, you will be renewed in supernatural living. Actually, the, the uh, abiding will determine the abundance. The abiding in the Spirit will, in him will, uh, will determine the abundance of your fruit. So that, that's why it's not a matter of age. That's why Paul will say, will call young Timothy, who's a young man in his 20s, and he will say to him, Timothy, be careful, be alert to stir up, to renew, to stir up the gift of God which is in you uh, so you don't become a withered fig tree. And that's why the Psalms calls out to all ages and, and begins with blessed is the man, the woman who, who delights today in the, in the law of God and meditates upon it day and night for they shall be like a tree planted, rooted by the river and, and he will bear fruit in every season. Would you say out loud in every season? Even in COVID season, you'll bear supernatural fruit and his, and his leaves shall never, never wither. I have, I hope and I pray that you understand, and I know this conviction is deep within your pastor's heart and the elder's, uh, elder's heart, but I hope and, and, and pray that you understand as you, as you come and be part of the body here at Times Square Church that this church was birthed, was born supernaturally that it was born supernaturally, that it has, been, uh, it has been multiplied supernaturally, it's been protected supernaturally, that this church has been used of God supernaturally, defended supernaturally, renewed supernaturally. How many of you know this place is a supernatural place by the power and the spirit of God? It's not the work of a man. It's not, you can give shout, you can give praise to God. This is, this work in the next season that we are, we are brought, we have been brought by God together for such a time as this to lay hold of the next season of Times Square's church history and heritage and it has to be supernatural. It has to be as we answer the call of Jesus to supernatural living. So we look at Mark chapter 11 and I want, I want to suggest to you the first, the first uh, principle is that this call to supernatural living is actually a confronting call. 
It confronts us, not as Jesus does, not in legalism, not in condemnation, but in a spirit of grace and truth, embracing to, to search me, O oh God, and know my ways, to, to expose our hearts before God. It's a, it's a confronting, there's a confronting to this calling. We, we're going read it, to read it together. Mark chapter 11 and verse 11. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, uh, the hour was already late. Verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to, uh, said to it, he's speaking to the fig tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the disciples heard it. Will you hear it today? Verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. There's a confronting to this call on all of our lives to the supernatural. There's a confronting. Jesus was hungry, and he was looking through the foliage to see if we'd find some fruit. I want you to know that Jesus is still hungry today. Jesus is hungry to manifest his life, his spirit. He is hungry for a people that will walk in the spirit. He's still hungry today, and he found nothing but leaves. Leaves, foliage. He went to see if perhaps he would find something. Jesus can see through our foliage and our leaves. He can see through the exterior and the, uh, what the, the good appearance that we can have. Uh, even what we, the, what we project. Men, God does not look like man looks. For man looks at the outward. But Jesus looks, God looks at the heart. So he looks through the foliage of a church, he looks through the foliage, he looks through the noise and the sound and, and, and what we appear to be, and, he sees, and he's looking through the foliage for supernatural fruit. He's looking for an evidence of his spirit in us. He's looking in our lives, because that's what he wants us to, that's how we glorify the Father. That's the only way that can differentiate us. He's looking for supernatural fruit in us, supernatural peace in the midst of turmoil supernatural joy when all well joy when when joy is a rarity all around supernatural perspective on everything that's taking place supernatural love supernatural humility supernatural giving supernatural forgiving say amen anytime you like supernatural fruit he's looking at a supernatural confidence supernatural perspective a supernatural generosity servant spirit in us jesus is still seeking supernatural fruit in us by his spirit he hungers to fill us with a supernatural fruit beyond our human cycles for it was not the season for figs in the natural cycles of the fig tree, it was not a season we would naturally produce. And there's a prophetic picture, there's a spiritual picture in this. Jesus is looking for us. He's looking to manifest a fruit in us that's beyond our natural abilities, our natural talents, our personalities, our capacities, our knowledge, our giftings, our education, our past. Spiritual, um, uh, spiritual achievements or sacrifices. He's looking today for a fruit that we cannot produce by personality, by force of habit, by sheer will, or by your own giftings and charisma. He's looking to uh, flow through you with supernatural fruit that we cannot produce in ourselves. He's looking for, and, and it is amazing that when we read that, that when we read that, there's a, qu a question that, that has to come to each of our hearts. Am I a foliage, leaves only Christian? Or can God, can Jesus find supernatural, do I, am I allowing him to produce supernatural fruit in me? Can he find supernatural fruit in me? Because please understand, this is why Times Square Church exists. 
Times Square Church exists to glorify his name by supernatural fruit for 51st and Broadway all these years for men and women to walk in here and to receive from God, to be healed from God, say yes, please, to be freed from God, to experience. This is why we exist to together as a body and as a believer yourself, but as a body to manifest his fruit, his supernatural fruit. 51st and Broadway, men and women for all these years coming in and experiencing the living God touching and changing their lives. Say yes, please. Jesus, Jesus still says, let no one eat fruit from the withered tree ever again. And the disciples heard it. And the question is, will we hear it today? Let no one, let, let no church member, not only here, now, let no church member in America be submitted to go church week after week in a place where it's leaves and foliage, but there's no life. When there is a, there's preaching without that piercing anointing and that conviction. Let no, let no, let, let me personalize this. Let no wife of a man who's, a, who's married to a Christian go through life with her husband always being simply limited to the bitter fruit of flesh without the supernatural. Let no, let no children grow up in a home. I'm a, I'm a, par, I'm a parent and a grandparent. Let no, let no child, let the children grow up in a home where mom and dad are in the flesh, are limited by their flesh. Let, let no one eat, uh, let no one eat from this tree ever again. And in the midst of a 21st century Christianity with a lot of foliage, a lot of leaves, God says to Times Square Church, I'm calling you to shine at this moment in time. Not only will that, you're not a church of leafage, a foliage, you're a church of supernatural fruit. Fruit, And whoever comes and eat of it, come and taste and see that the Lord is good, yes. Literally, Jesus still says that, that no one eat from this fruit ever again. The disciples saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Please understand this. When you see a believer, a ministry, a church, and oftentimes we look from outside from a human perspective and there's a, a falling away or a breaking or a, a sudden drying up and you'll have somebody say, oh, it seemed to be going so well. They, how come it happened so suddenly in a church, right here in the city or wherever? They, it happened so suddenly. Please understand, it never happens suddenly. When there's a, a drying up that takes place in the spirit realm, it has been leaves and foliage only for a long time. So Jesus says, confronts us in love. There's a confronting, but then there's a, there's a commissioning to this calling to the supernatural. Jesus never only gives us the warning and the confronting. He makes it clear. Uh, he makes clear the way to come back to the supernatural, to the source. The, uh, never only repentance, but restoration. There's a commissioning to this calling. We call the great commission. Jesus finished his, uh, uh, after his resurrection, his last words, go ye. Go, it's the great commission. I want you to hear this very, very simply. Simple obedience causes the supernatural to open. And we look in, the, in the Mark chapter 11, the same chapter, it begins with these words, verse 1 to 3. Now when they drew near Jerusalem, uh, Bethany, the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, go into the village right in front of you. And as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt or a donkey tied on which no one has sat. Loosen it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You answer, you say, the Lord has need of it. There's a confronting to this calling and there's a commissioning to this calling. And these, these three little verses, let me unpack them for you. They are filled with powerful principles for supernatural living. The, the first thought is that Jesus sent two of his disciples. Notice. No names, no, no hierarchy, no status, no seniority or lofty titles. Why? Because the commissioning to simple obedience to what Jesus asks and calls for is still, uh, is still the only biblical path for, for all of us, without exception. The, the most anonymous uh, believer in the audience to the one holding the mic, it is through obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It is through obedience in the secret place. Obedience when no one is looking. Obedience in things that seem of little matter to us. Uh, and simple obedience to God that the, supernaturally, the supernatural opens in our lives. It's just disciples. Just, just disciples, no name. So the question to you is, and to me is, how is the fig tree, how is the fig tree of your life in terms of simple obedience? 
How's the fig tree of your life? Is, this, is it just foliage and leaves? Or is there really a true living fruit of obedience? How tender is your heart in simple obedience in everyday life? When, when Jesus, when, when the Spirit of God, a still small voice calls you, Jesus calls you to, to obey him. To, he calls you to let go of something. When Jesus says enough, Enough of the, the, the 15th series on Netflix. Enough of, of that, all that time on Facebook and social media. When, uh, when, he, he, when Jesus whispers to your heart, enough of the, uh, the mob angry online fighting among Christians about all the sanitary subjects and all the... When Jesus says uh, release, when Jesus says be careful with that relationship, it is a dangerous one. When Jesus says give, when Jesus says comes back, come back to the house of God. When Jesus says it's your time to serve, it's the time to give, to release, to love. Love. How is your obedience? Because obedience ho- opens the heaven over our lives. That's the question. That's the question. Uh, simple obedience today, not yesterday's obedience. Yesterday's obedience brought today's blessing over your life. Yesterday and today's blessing. But yesterday's obedience will not take you into, into tomorrow. It is, it is, yeah. How is your obedience today? Not yesterday and not someday. How is your be- obedience? I believe God brought people here and online. And right now the Holy Spirit in love is confronting your heart and saying, there's something I've been calling you to do, to be, to release, to let go, to, to cut away from your life. And, and I'm using my servant to speak to you, to bring it to you again. When, when he calls you to serve and obey him in what what's right in front of you. He's told the disciples, you go to that village right in front of you, in, in, with your kids, in your own home, with your husband, with your wife, right here in this church. This is an age with online, when everybody is looking for prophetic words that will take them to the nations. We are here, 51st and Broadway in New York City. He's placed us here, and he's called us to serve with what's right in front of us. Say yes, please. Right in front of you, right here. Simple, simple obedience to his commissioning today gives us access to, the, to tomorrow's blessing and breakthrough. Simple obedience to commissioning today in what appears insignificant to, to you prepares the supernatural. Please, please understand. Whoever the two disciples were when they said, when they got received the orders from God to you go and untie the donkey. Please understand, in the previous chapters, they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. You look into some chapter, you, you can almost hear them say, I'm tied a donkey. I'm here to tell you that in simple obedience and things maybe you've never done before or appear to be uh, insignificant to you, do not despise the days of what appears to you to be small beginnings. They are preparing a harvest when you're faithfully taking care of your kids, preparing a lunch, praying uh, over them, serving here in this church. There's some, uh, there are moments where we feel during this pandemic, everything has been taken away from us. Serve where you are right now and let him open the heavens on you. Because simple commissioning, obedience to his commissioning today cannot replace yesterday's obedience or a loved one's obedience. It's possible for a husband to be, to, to, to kind of depend on his wife serving God, loving God, and you're just along for the ride. It's certainly possible for kids to grow up in a home. It's possible for you to be sitting in Times Square Church and there's so many people that are surrendering to God in obedience and you're like under the, the covering, under the blessing. This is a moment in time. This is an, an age where God is speaking to you and saying it's not enough for you to be around people that are obedient. You need today to open life and say, God, what do you ask of me? What shall I do for you now today? It's what I call GPS obedience. Never in history, maybe, uh, through these, these almost two years of the pandemic where all our plans are blown to, to pieces, uh, do we need to be obedient in what I call GPS obedience? You have the next turn only. You think you have an idea of the general destination, but you don't have the detailed itinerary. I would say it this way, don't despise the donkey. Don't despise what appears small to you now. Say, plant your feet on the ground of faith. Obey him now in what he gives you, what's in front of you, and watch him use you to his glory. Say yes, please. It's a, if they say to you, if they ask you, why are you doing this? And please understand, please believe me, society will ask you. Your friends will ask you. Culture will ask you. Your friends will ask you. Your families will ask you. Your flesh, your own flesh sometimes will ask you. Your foe, your enemy, Satan himself will ask you, believe me, why are you doing this? 
Why are you holding on? Why are you praying? Why are you standing here on Thanksgiving, lifting your hands and worshiping and thanking God when there's so many things in your life, uh, when you, so many things that have not happened as you had planned? Why are you keeping yourself for God? Why are you giving? Why are you serving? In this season of the pandemic, millions of Christians have been tormented in their spirit by the enemy shouting, why? Why you keep doing this? Why are you still at it? The, believe me, obedience to the word of God, to the commissioning to obey scriptures and, and the words of Jesus in faith, in sanctification, in humility, in forgiveness, in service, in meekness, and in love is not something that will be, uh, it's something that will be rarely applauded, celebrated, or even understood in our, in our selfish, self-serving, I am king society. And let me say this. It's even a reality that we have to be, to have to be alert and aware of in Christendom. In, in this post, in this post-pandemic, online, there, there's a, 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 a movement of online consumer spirit, uh, spiritual buffet mentality. Where I pick what I want, I like this preacher and this one, a little bit of worship, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. And, and there's a whole movement, there's, a, there's tens of millions of Christians, that the commitment has gone down, and there's no, no serving, there's no giving, there's no, uh, there's no committing, and there's many blinded religious voices that are peddling the lie of supernatural fruit without, uh, uh, supernatural, uh, su supernatural, uh, the supernatural without sa sacrifice or service. Glory without generosity. Peddling the lie of impact for Christ without intimacy with him. Power, uh, without pers uh, power with him without, uh, without personal prayer. Redefining church, promising revival, renewal, without repentance, without this response in obedience. Can I say to you today, obedience is still the only door that opens a supernatural of our lives. <laughs> Commitment. Voices of foliage without faith, fruit or fire. Open heaven without obedience and humility. The question is, do you know what is the ultimate detonator to ignite the supernatural in your life? In these, in these simple words, that, well, you can read it at home. You, Jesus calls them, they go, and they, they serve exactly as he, as he had asked. And there's a powerful verse in verse 6. Uh, without understanding, they're just untying the donkey and, and preparing. They don't know that they're preparing the way for the Messiah to enter Jerusalem. They're, they're fulfilling prophetic destinies that will affect all of mankind as they're untying the donkey. I'm here to tell you today, here to tell you today that these words are the, are the detonator to your faith. Uh, Mark 11, 6, and they spoke to them just as Jesus had, just as Jesus had commanded them. Simple obedience. What am I talking about? We're sitting here in Times Square Church. I'm talking about a man in the hills of Pennsylvania years ago. Pastor David Wilkerson, praying and seeking God. And God says, you go to New York City to speak to street gangs. And he goes, just as Jesus commanded him. And we are here today. And the world has changed. I'm talking about a, a man in Canada, Pastor Carter Conlon. Uh, living in a, a sir, serving in a, a, in a small church in a village. I know that. I've been to that town, to a couple of hundred people. And he tells himself in his, in his life's testimony that as a young man, he was so terrified he would, he would faint even to speak in public. Even during his ministry, of, I, I've stood on stages where he shared the story, even in ministry, of going through a, a burnout and a time of feeling so, so weak and broken and hearing a call. God saying, you will go to New York City to lift up Pastor David's arm. Arms and, and, and he did just as Jesus commanded him. And here we are. I'm talking about a young man, a kid, a kid, 19 years old, single, going into the inner city of Detroit, starting pioneering a church at the very gates of hell. And Pastor Tim Delina being used of God. And, uh, and all through these following years, being molded, being prepared, uh, Pastor Tim never doubted one second, never, never listened one second to the voice of the enemy. You've been brought to this place for such a time as this because we walk in obedience just as Jesus commanded. Would you say yes, please? and give him praise. Come on. There's a commissioning to this. There's a commissioning to, to uh, this call. He called them. Uh, he called them the disciples to, to obedience. And it's a multi-intergenerational call. Don't miss this. 
when I read this, the, the, it was like a, a, such a witness in my spirit for all of us, but especially at this time in history, as the son of Times Square, uh, Time Square Church, they obey, they prepare, they lay the branches. Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. And in verse 9, then those who were before and those who followed cried out together saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I was, I was... I was filled with these words, those who came before, those who went before, and those who followed after. And I felt a calling as a son of Times Square Church to call on men and women, mature Christians. You've been here at Times Square Church for a long time. We need you as fathers. We need you. Paul said you have a lot of teachers, but you have few fathers. When Paul addressed the Thessalonians, in spite of his, his background as a Pharisee, that, that his entire background was, was trained not to show any emotion or human attachment. But when he writes the Thessalonians chapter, first Thessalonians, too. He says, I was with you like a caring mother, a nursing mother caring for you. I was with you like a father taking care of you, challenging you, exhorting you, loving you, protecting you. I believe the Spirit of God is saying to older, more mature believers in Times Square Church, we need those that came before. There's so many that are coming after you, so many young ones coming in the church. We need fathers. We need mothers. We need mentors, brothers, sisters that will model the fruitful supernatural life for the younger ones. Literally, literally will model peace and calm and trust in the midst of a thousand angry and agitated voices who will model humility and love and healing and forgiveness and commitment to justice in a, in a strifeful, divided, exploding society who will model service, who will model a deep, a deep sense of gratitude for all that God did in Times Square Church yesterday, deep sense for what God did yesterday, but will, will be in line, will be at God's heartbeat saying, oh, the things of old have been fulfilled. Behold, I announce new things for Times Square Church. We need mothers and fathers and brothers that will uh, rise up and grab young ones by the hands and say, let's serve together and build the kingdom of God right now for what God has prepared for us. Would you, would you give him a hand not only for what he did, we need to on this Thanksgiving Sunday, but also for what he will do. Come on, give him a shout for a second. It's a call to supernatural living. There's a, conf uh, a, a confronting to this call, a commissioning, and I close with this. There's a cleansing to this call. You read it at home, verse 8 to 10. You, you know these verses as they obeyed, as they obeyed. And Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus uh, calls them and they obey and, and he enters into Jerusalem and it is loud. There's, boys, there's loud voices in the midst of the, the, the loud hosannas, the exuberant crowds. And it's all the singing, it's worshiping. It's, and it's just so, so public, so exciting. So, but Jesus has his eyes fixed on the temple. All this noise, all this Hosanna, blessed be the one who came in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. And this verse that we often overlook, but verse 11, right uh, uh, over, you can hear the Hosannas in the background. But Jesus went into the temple, and when he had looked at all things, and believe me, in the midst of all the noises in modern, in, the, in our 21st century, end of the second year of this pandemic, and all the noises and all, Jesus is looking at your heart. He's looking, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's looking right at, at our hearts. The difference between leaves and foliage only Christians with no supernatural fruit and a believer walking in supernatural fruit that is being renewed will be your daily answer to this question. Will you still allow Jesus to overturn tables in your life? Because when he walks in the temple, you know the passage, many of you, but in verse 15, so he came to Jerusalem and then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. Verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple and he taught, saying to them, is, is it not written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. 
This is so, so important because Jesus cleansed the temple, turned over tables at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. There was, it is very important for you and me to understand that there should never be a season in your life when table turning is over. Where you don't, it never should be a season in your life where you're not allowing him and asking him, Lord, are there any, any tables that need to be turned? And I want to speak to, to many, many, many of us that many years of our lives we would allow him to turn tables in our lives. Even when we came to him, oh God, take, take it all. Take the sin, take the, the bondage, take the, uh, and the, we were sensitive to allowing him to turn tables. But the question of the spirit is, are you allowing him? That's the only way supernatural fruit is renewed. Are we allowing him to turn over? Over tables in our lives today. Are we allowing his spirit to say, to say, this, this in your life needs to be turned over in order for my, the flow of my spirit to be restored? Uh, perpetual tables. All of us, all of us have perpetual battles. Uh, there's universal battles, but there's battles that are, that are, that are common to us. They, it's life battles. It's, a, a, it's something that you, you always have to turn the tables. And if you think of Moses, it's anger at the beginning of his life, at the end of his life. And each of us have something. It's, a, it's, it's in your personalities. It's in your flesh, your nature, your baggage, your emotional, psychological, cultural, religious background. It's also, uh, and, and do you know that during this pandemic, as people, many, many believers not coming to church have brought their God guards down and old sins, old uh, dependencies, old, uh, old uh, captivities uh, come back to grip them. Do you know, do you read, do you read the, the stats of how many people starting using drugs again? Starting so using uh, smoking pot again. I was walking in Rockefeller Center yesterday. I've been coming here for 35 years. I'm never walking, smelling, smelling pot and, and smelling marijuana everywhere, uh, smelling it everywhere. And, and you, ha you have Christians that, that let their guard down uh, during this pandemic. I'm here to say to you today, you still need to say, oh God, come and turn the table. Overturn the table in my life today. Let, uh, let, I'm allowing you to come and show me tables that need to be overturned. Some are per perpetual and some are very particular. There's tables that we need to turn that are particular to season. Do you understand? Would you agree with me that there's some COVID tables to be overturned? Tables of anger, tables of frustration, tables of impatience, tables of I don't know what you're doing, tables of anger between Christians, tables of taking positions uh, endlessly on things that are, that are uh, gnawing at our spirits. Can we say to, together today, oh God, I want to turn every COVID table and serve you with a heart that is fixed on your kingdom. There's tables that need to be over overturned, personal table, private tables that nobody sees. Away from the public eye, only you and God know about. But they have profound consequence of your dis on your destiny and your calling, of pride, of sin, of jealousy, of unforgiveness. Release them today, and you will be free. Earth has no sorrow, has no sin that heaven can't heal. If you allow him today and say, God, this table, I, I want you to turn it. I overturned it in my life. It is so, it is so, it is so important. The table of my plans, the table of what, what I had prepared, the tables of, the tables of, of prayerlessness, lust of passion, my, my, my turn over the tables, my house shall be a house of prayer. You know, many years, um, a few years ago was the 25th anniversary of our church. And we, it was before the COVID, and we, we were so blessed to have different speakers come in throughout the year. We had scheduled speakers to come in throughout the year. Pastor Tim came, such amazing blessing. Pastor Carter uh, came. And we were booked. We were scheduled in June. In September, we were scheduled with, and I'm not going to name, but with the pastor who was America's most well-known pastor, a, a network of a thousand churches. But it was canceled because... Immorality was found in his background. And then, then in September, we were booked. We had a whole weekend, a whole conference for 21st anniversary with what was then one of the most well-known apologists in the world and in the recent history. But again, even after his death. And I, now, I have no judgment and no pointing a finger, but there's something that threw me 
on my knees when I see this in the nation and when I see this in our own church and when I see it with friends around me. All these men, women, were loved God, served Him passionately, but there was a moment in their life, there was a season where Jesus said, overturn that table, overturn that. Did they stop allowing Him to overturn table? I don't stand in judgment or in pride. I stand trembling before God and I say, oh God, let there be no day where I don't allow you to overturn table in my life that I would serve you well. Will you say yes, please? This could save your life. When, when Jesus overturned the table in the gospel of John, the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal, John 2, 17, the zeal for your house has eaten me up. The zeal for your house has consumed me. When I read this after almost 40 years of ministry, I had to ask myself, really? Can I say today, God, your zeal is Your passion, your love. The, the word zeal is, is just an amazing word. Both, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, it speaks of passion, of, of, of a burning love, passionate commitment, the protective intense, almost like a jealousy, the protective intense. I'm all in. Love for his house, for his people, for his will, for his purposes. It consumes me. And Jesus goes further. He says, actually, if you don't allow me to turn the tables... And, and, and you don't restore the house of prayer in your life, you actually become a house of thieves. You're thieving. And I, and I, was, just, I was just struck by that. And Matthew underlines that. He says the same, the same uh, overturning of tables, the cleansing of the temple, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. But that is, as the tables are being overturned, The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did and the children crying out of the temple and saying, Hosanna, the son of David, they were offended. They were indignant. There might not be a time in recent history where there were so many believers online offended, being, being indignant, being offended, having lost perspective to the kingdom. And yes, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. The question is, am I a testimony fig tree or am I a thieving fig tree? When, when I'm not turning over the tables and when, when uh, my, I've moved away from the house of prayer, my own life, my own life of communion with Christ, I'm robbing myself of the man God would want me to be. I'm robbing myself of the joy and of the patience and of the grace that he would want to give me supernaturally. I'm robbing my wife of the husband God would want me to be to her. I'm robbing my kids of the man. And as a church, as a ministry, as a, if we, you understand, Jesus stood here and when he turned over the tables, he was taking them back to the day when the glory of God came over the temple on dedication day and God said, it's simple. My house will be a house of prayer. You will call on me, I will answer you. When you are, move, when you move away from me, if you repent and call on me, I will take you back. When you are sick, you will call on me and I will heal you. When the enemy comes against you like a flood and everybody thinks it's over for you, I will come. You'll call me and I will come and defend you and stand with you and give you victories that nobody can believe or understand. This place is a house of prayer. We call on him and he, and he answers. We call on him and he answers. It is still only by prayer that the blind will walk in that the lame will walk in and be healed. Not only, not only in, in ministry, in my own blindness, in my own lameness, it is only as I allow him to turn over the tables that he restores. And there's something that was so precious to me very, that, that, that touched me deeply when the young, the, the healings took place, t -t table overturned. Glory of God comes, healing takes place, and little children begin to sing and shout, seeing the great things God is doing. Do you hear with me? Uh, are you with me in this heart that we need the children and the teenager of Times Square Church to see the glory of God, to shout the praises of God as we lift up our, and God moves and changes lives. I'm going to close with this. This is, I believe, deep into the ethos, into the heart, into the foundation of Times Square Church and of our founding Pastor, Pastor David Wilkerson, I'm going to ask the, uh, Freddie and the wonderful worship to come. I've had so many 
Amazing experience, 33 years preaching here on the stage at all, so many services, and even before the service, we were uh, speak, reminiscing of some moments with Brother Dave, and, and tears, it, it, so, such a, yeah, give me a second, such a privilege for me, my, my wife knows, for a kid like me from the worst neighborhoods in Montreal, and I, I've preached a thousand sermons to 50 people or less in the province of Quebec, and for me even to be here one time, but to be here 33 years, living with you, this, this miracle church, is just such a absolutely undeserved grace and honor. And I've seen so many amazing things here and altar calls and a move of the Spirit. And, and there's one moment uh, that I, I shared um, that I never forgot, that so many things Pastor David did that, that marked me for life. But this one time we, we, I began coming to preach here, and after a couple of years, we were having uh, supper together. And, and he said to me, matter of factly, he says, oh, he says, um, uh, last week or the week before, there's a man who preached here. We had a guest, but when he was preaching, it wasn't right. So I stood up, I came to him, I tapped him, and I said, brother, you have to stop, please. This is not right. And uh, Pastor Tim says, diplomat diplomatically, uh, Brother Dave would say, uh, the Lord is moving in a different direction. That means you're, you're finished. You're over. And, and, and Brother Dave would tap him on the shoulder, and, and, and get, he took the mic, and the guy went and sat down, and he did it in love and in kindness. Brother Dave was a shepherd. He was protecting the flock. But when he told me this, I'm listening to this, all right. I started thinking, it's going to happen to me. <laughs> One day, he's going to come and stop me. I'm going to say something wrong. I was just a young 20-some-year-old. 20, 20 and um, I would come for years and years. I would do my two services in the morning, fly in, and I would come to preach the Sunday night and the Tuesday night. But I would come sometimes. The worship would, would be started. I'd be right off the plane, right on stage. And, we'd just, uh, and, and that night, I, I came and I began preaching. And I was preaching on spiritual passion. And as in the words of Job, the things I fear most happened to me. I, I, I never looked at Brother Dave. You, they used to sit over there, and, and I never looked at him. And, and, but, but that time I'm preaching, I'm coming to the end of my message, and I see him, like in my worst nightmare, I see him get up, and he start walking towards me. And it was like, it's like he's in slow motion. He was just like coming to me. And, and, and it's, a short, it's a short distance, but I, I'm reviewing my message in my head. What did I say? What did I say? What did I say? And, I, and, and the whole church goes, <gasps> You know, they see him come, and, and I don't know what your eschatological position is, but I wanted the rapture now at that moment. And I got the mic, and I said, you want the mic? I didn't say anything. He said, he said yes. Oh, I give him the mic, and I'm just, I'm dead. I walk away. I'm going back to my seat. But he didn't preach, and there was, this, there was some people that are here today that were there that night. He didn't say anything. He just came right here in the pulpit. And he fell on his knees. The place was full. And this is a man who preached to the world, preached to the nations. But it was just him and God. And he began to weep and pray. Oh God, where is my passion? I had preached that night on the broken reed he will not throw away, the flickering flame he will not put out. And he began to pray, oh God, I'm a, fl I'm a flickering flame. Oh, God, restore my passion for your presence. When was the last time? He was praying out loud. We're all, we're all on our knees. He says, when was the last time I just, I just spent time with you? I'm praying over messages. I'm praying for finances. I'm praying for miracles. I'm praying for, for uh, growth. I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. But, but Lord, when was the last time I just, I just shut my door to be with you, just to hear from you? When was the last time I read my Bible for just to be fed by you and hearing from you, for you to search my own heart. I'm reading to get messages, to preach more messages. Oh God, he began to weep. He said, oh God, I, I walk over to homeless and I don't even see him anymore. Oh God, there's a, there's a young drug addict and he, he grabs me when I'm coming out of church and I'm, oh God, I was, oh, I was bugged by him. I was, I, was, I was curt to him. Oh God, restore my heart, restore. And the whole church fell on their knees. Balcony, made, there, was, there was people, we were told, there was a thousand people in the annex, and in the annex, people fell to the ground. Because our, I believe what he, is, what he was expressing to God and to us is I will not be, I will never be a withered fig tree in Jesus' name.
And all of God's people say one last, amen, and amen, and amen, and amen, and amen. Please, please stand with me for a moment. Please stand with me for a moment. Would you raise your hands? Can we have a moment of prayer now? Can you, before, before the whirlwind of life takes you out and you just, you just rush out on the streets, can we lift our hands and say, God, I'm offering myself to you today. Can I hear? The book of Acts says they were all in one place and they, they all prayed, all lifted their voices together and the place where they were assembled trembled and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I hear a thousand voices going up to God right now? Say, God, I'm going. Just speak to him. Oh God, I'm, here I am. Lord, Lord God, I will not be. I will not be a withered fig tree. I will not be a, a withered fig tree in Jesus' name. Lord God, I know you're hungry to come and fill me again. So, so God, come, come again. Whatever is withered in me, I give to you. Like that man in Mark 3, Lord God, take my withered hand. Take my withered prayer. Take my dried up worship. Take my dried up passion to serve you. Take my dried up forgiveness. Take my dry, dried up just zeal to serve you. If it's dried up, my, my dried up confidence in the future, my faith that I had that you, you were the way maker. Oh God, today I bring it up to you. Come and heal it. Come and heal what is dried up in me. Let me hear men and women of all ages, multi-generational. Let me hear fathers and mothers that say, God, I realize today I have a call in this church. I have a place in this church. I have a mission in this church. Those that went before must model for those that are coming after. Oh God, we lift our voices to you. Turn the table. Tell them today. Turn the table online, online right now. And here in this building, the Holy Spirit is showing you the tables that need to be overturned. So today, oh God, we overturn the tables and we pray, come and restore, come and restore. Lord God, I surrender all. Lift, the, lift your hands with me. Let me hear one heart, one voice, Freddie, lead us today. I surrender all.